Hey, y'all. Welcome back to Mountain Murders Offbeat. I'm Heather. And I'm a silly goose. <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> Named Dylan. You just need an ascot and like a little sweater vest. Ooh, I always wanted an ascot. I'm going to get you one for Christmas. You know, I must uh, not shop in premier stores because I've never seen them for sale in the, you know, retail environments I'm in. Yeah, like the Goodwill? Or well, I've never seen ascots in Walmart. I was going to say, I've never seen you really shop for uh, clothing or anything like that. So, Well, yeah. I just leave the uh, the snack aisle and go over to where the jeans are. That's my clothes shopping. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. How you been doing this week, Dylan? I'm doing good, man. I'm running and gunning, you know, just taking care of shit. TCB. You ready to bring the funk? Well, I already brought it. The funk's already here. It's just in the other room. I thought I smelled something. Yeah. Okay. You know what? The last time we recorded, I smelled my feet the entire time, and it was distracting because I had boot feet, right? <laughs> You're gross. Well, and I wasn't trying to even be, I'm not trying to be gross, and I don't typically have smelly feet, but my work boots smell. Why are you telling us this? <sighs> I feel like we well, just lost like 18 listeners. <clears throat> I want them to come back, and I want them to hear me out. Because this time I'm not being distracted by my foot odor. That's good. So you're gonna get the, you're gonna get the real deal. I feel very fortunate at the moment that um, my sinuses are all stuffed up. Oh. Yeah. I'm like, you old snotty bitch. Thanks for that. Damn. Well, at least I don't have to smell you. You you I don't think you smelled it because smelly you would have you would have stopped the podcast and be like you're gonna have to do something because you don't do feet smells. I don't do weird smells at all. Okay. okay. So if the back of my knee stunk, you would not be into that. <laughs> so One, just, I'm not sure how I would even discover this information, okay? So, uh, yeah, it's not localized I'm to not the feet. I'm like Amerigo Vespucci. I'm not like exploring, you know? There's that. Okay, so now you're going to try to make me feel dumb. But I don't even know who that is you said. Cool. Okay. It's not hard to make you feel dumb. Okay, uh, Dylan. Uh, do you have something productive to say, or should we move on with our episode? Well, yeah. I can tell everyone that when we started, you was like, this is an offbeat, so you can be more you. <laughs> and, and I took that to mean I can be like, I don't have to, you know, tone down my dumb shit. Okay, I have one question for you, Dylan. What's it like to be married to the champion? Oh, my God. So, yeah, we went bowling, and apparently Heather won. Both games. Both games. Oh my God, you're the reigning and defending champion. I can't, I got skills, right? The PBA is going to be calling I'm you. I'm good with these little uh, carpal tunnel wrists. <laughs> <laughs> you just walk up there like Roseanne Barr and just look at everybody sitting there and just throw the ball. Yes. And get a strike. Yes. That's how it went. That's pretty much how it went. Okay, so we're a little loosey goosey tonight, but what do you have for us? Are you well, you got something over there? Yeah, you I ready? Was, I just got me. You just got you. I got you, babe. Are you ready? Let's do it. They called it the rock. <laughs> oh my god, so the story's about me. They said it was escape proof and sent habitual escapees from other correctional facilities there. Confident they'd never scale the walls or make it across the treacherous one and a quarter mile of frigid water to the mainland. Where could you be talking about? And for the most part, they were right. During the 29 years that it served as a federal penitentiary, I can never say that word right. I'm so country. <laughs> There were 14 escape attempts from Alcatraz. Oh, my God. The impenetrable. Involving the, 36 inmates. The unescapable. The inescapable. Uh, it's unable to be escaped. It's unescapable. <laughs> <laughs> 23 of those were swiftly recaptured. Six were shot and killed by guards and two drowned. Only five are unaccounted for. Oh, my God. Two of those were Theodore Cole and Ralph Rowe, who attempted to swim across the San Francisco Bay in 1937 and are believed to have drowned in the attempt. The fate of the other three, Frank Morris and the Anglin brothers, John and Clarence, is more ambiguous. They entered the water in an impoverished raft in June of 1962. Wait a second. This was a poor raft? It was a very poor raft. Dylan, this raft was so poor... 
it would call you and ask you for money. It'd be like, let me hold 20, man. It would be. This raft was so poor, instead of hoping one day it would have a BMW, it was like, I hope a Mercedes hits me while I'm crossing the street. Oh, my God. It was God. a poor-ass raft. Then, did you have all this raft material ready? Maybe. Or is that off your dome? Maybe. This raft was so poor, it walked around wearing a little Newsies hat and had a bowl, and it was like, please, may I have another bowl of soup? I'm just a poor raft. A starving raft? Yeah. That's it's starting to make me sad. Let's move on from the poor raft. raft's name was Oliver. So this poorly constructed raft... An impoverished raft. <laughs> ...was their conveyance across the dangerous waters. The official line is that they drowned because they were never seen again. There is reason to believe that they might not have. Frank Morris was an enigma. He had a genius level IQ of 133. Frank was nonetheless a habitual felon and had been since his early teens. He wasn't some criminal mastermind either. Frank's crimes were petty, impulsive, and often reckless. Oh, interesting. Abandoned as a child, Frank had spent his formative years being shuffled from one foster home to another. He had racked up his first arrest at age 13, landing in juvie. From that point on, his life was a monotonous cycle, brief periods of freedom, and then these long incarcerations, ranging from things like drug possession to armed robbery, the charges. So it sounds like you have this guy who's intelligent, right? Yeah. But impulsive as well, and just unable to get his shit together, it sounds like. He also earned a reputation as an accomplished escape artist, landing him eventually in Alcatraz as inmate number AZ-1441. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Wow, that's weird. I have that tattooed on my back. I thought so. John and Clarence Anglin had followed similar paths through life. The Anglins weren't drawn to crime by abandonment issues, though. They were members of a large clan. With them, it was the crippling poverty and backbreaking labor that they had endured being farm laborers that drove them to criminality. So they were just try trying to come up in the world any means necessary. They just wanted to put in a hard day's labor for an honest week's pay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so they wanted to rob instead of working hard. They just didn't want to do the backbreaking work. <clears throat> Don't blame them, right? Alfred, they had a brother named Alfred, by the way, and he eventually landed up at the Federal Pen in Atlanta after a series of bank robberies, and John and Clarence soon found themselves in the same prison. That was where they met Frank Morris. Like Morris, they were noted escapists, a habit that saw them eventually ship to The Rock. Oh, my God. Are you talking about the one with um, Nicolas Cage and Sean Connery? Yes. That's a good movie. There, they were placed in adjacent cells, flanked on either side by Morris and a guy named Alan West, who would end up in Alcatraz after a failed escape from a prison in Florida. West had served time with the Anglin brothers before, and he knew Frank Morris by reputation. Okay. So they all kind of know of each other, maybe, or he knows of this group. Yeah, I mean, I imagine it's like maybe you're part of a dodgeball organization, you know, in your small town. And so you know other people within like the dodgeball league, right? Oh man, have you ever heard it's of that? Like, like small uh, community kind of thing. Those rec leagues for like adults playing uh, playground games, yes. like kickball and such. Yeah. Oh, I want to join one. You do? What playground game do you want to play? Um, I would play kickball and maybe tag if we were doing like walking tag to where like crisply turn left at a slow walk. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I was never a fan of kickball. You didn't like kickball. Well, here's why. Okay, I'm getting it sidetracked with you here. I was in seventh grade. Oh my God, you took it to the face. I had, and no. then the ball hit you. No, <laughs> I had an ingrown toenail, right? Oh my and God. And I had to have surgery where they like cut the nail and then they kill the root with like a laser or something. Oh my God. So like your toenail doesn't grow back on that side, if that makes sense. So I'd had like this minor surgery if you will right had my toe all bandaged up and couldn't wear shoes for several days i had on like birkenstocks right because this is back in like the early 90s when we were all crunchy grooves my PE teacher makes me participate in kickball 
even though I've got this gigantic bandage on my toe and, and a doctor's note. And basically having to wear sandals because you can't wear regular shoes. Yeah, his name was Mr. Shepard, and he was kind of a dick. So he made me play kickball, and I was like, but that's going to fuck my toe up. And he was like, get out there, and made me play kickball. And I remember my toe started gushing blood, and I bled all over my Birkenstocks, and they were new, by the way. And my mom was so mad because she's like, those were $80 shoes, you know. So you had like a couple of stitches and stuff in your toe and everything, Well, right? no, but it was like, you know, it, it was all wrapped up and like it was still pretty sore. Don't you just love those old school do it or else gym teachers? Everyone's going to participate no matter what bullshit. Yeah. Yeah. And they always wore the same kind of shorts and shit, like this kind of tie athletic, I'm a coach shorts. He always walked like <clears throat> a cowboy who'd been on the cattle trail for like four weeks and he jumped off his horse because he was kind of like, I don't know. He always, he always walked like he was riding a horse or something. Oh, so he walks, uh, he's bow legged? Yeah. Yeah. That's what it's Okay. Called. He walks like he's galled <laughs> Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's got them all. Oh, musty so nuts. So then after that, I never liked kickball because it would just like make me think about my poor sore toe. We'll get back to that. But, you know, I'm saddened by your story that um you, you never were allowed to love kickball because of this man's actions. I know, right? And I'd find it abhorrent. And um I think he's a dick. Mr. Shepard, if you hear this. He's probably dead. You made a mistake that day, <laughs> sir. He was old then. Probably not lasted the last, you know, like 30-something years. Turns out he's a fucking vampire. <laughs> Probably. Right? Maybe he was mean. But I did like Red Rover, and I would definitely send you Red Rover. Can I get back to my story now? Yeah. So the original inkling of an escape plan began to take shape in December of 1961 when Alan West found several old saw blades discarded in a utility corridor. Wes took these to Morris, and from that point on, it was Morris who took charge of the escape plan, despite West's later attempts to take credit. The plan was simple in concept, but extremely complex to execute. The men would widen the ventilation ducts positioned under the wash basins in their cells. They would enter the shaft and climb up onto the roof of the cell block. From there... They would climb down a vent pipe to the ground, make their way to the shore, and board a raft that they would row across the bay to the mainland. Oh, yeah. That sounds simple. So far, so simple, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah sounds, right? Um, yeah. But making it work would require ingenuity, nerve, and a healthy dose of, well, just fucking good luck, Dylan. There's no other way to put it. You know, if my buddy, uh, we're talking about escaping, and I'm, he's finally, he's like, I got the plan ready, and he tells me this plan you just read, first thought was, I'm going to be too fat for the vent. I just know it. It's a good reason to work out in the yard. Yeah, yeah, and they'd be like, a old packer over there is working out a lot. You got to keep your eyes on him. I don't trust him. The first task given to each of the men was to widen the vents in their cells. This was achieved with crude tools, because they don't really have, like, good working tools, right? They just kind of had to make up their own. Out of old saw blades, metal spoons they smuggled out of the mess hall, and later they did get an electric drill constructed from a vacuum cleaner motor that West would eventually steal. Oh, nice. Right, so it's not like they just have some pickaxes and easy shit, right? They're like using spoons to dig with. Uh, yeah, some of the more um, popular escape stories, I always find it fascinating because it's, um, well, of course, you know, if a, some monster, murderer, rapist guy escapes and then does it again, that's obviously terrible. But the idea of escaping from prison is almost kind of romantic in a way. Is, is Does that make sense? Right. Even if you deserve to be in prison? You Have you seen the film with Jim Carrey <laughs> called I Love You, Philip Morris and Christian Bale? Is it Christian Bale? No, it's, I'm sorry, it's Ewan McGregor. Um, No. Because Jim Carrey plays a guy who escapes from prison, like, so many times. It's really, like, a quirky kind of comedy. You should check it out. Okay. Well, you know, if you bend a... It's based on a true story. If you take a standard fork, bend the two middle prongs down out of your way, um, it will fit a half-inch bolt. Okay. Just let you know. Thanks. 
These efforts, of course, made noise, and so their work was confined to music hour every evening when the sound of Frank Morris's accordion masked the scraping and drilling and banging. The escapees also made screens of painted cardboard to cover the holes they were making in the walls. These were good enough to fool the casual observer. If any guards had decided to take a closer look, they would have been busted. So this is definitely like if you've seen the Shawshank Redemption, how Andy Dufresne like digs his way out, right? And he's got the poster. And at first it was like Gilda, uh, what was it? Uh, Rita Hayworth from the film Gilda. And then it becomes like Raquel Welch, right? So it just kind of changes over the course, but he's always got the poster hanging to cover up the wall that he's demolished. Um, That's, oh yeah, oh yeah. He would like to slowly take the dirt out and dump yeah. it in the yard out his pant leg and stuff. It just seems, uh, but you know, here's the thing. Inmates have nothing but time on their hands, right? And observing the guards, everybody tends to have a routine. I think um, you would have to have like a routine in a setting like that. And uh, all they do is have time on their hands to figure things out. And I must say some of the, even down to just cooking and getting by with, you know, repurposing items or something like that. Convicts, inmates, I don't know what they'd prefer to be called. Um, they're ingenious. You, you know what I mean? Some of the stuff you see. Yeah. I would just sit around being a great philosopher of my generation. You would just be I deep. got a lot of time. I'm just going to have some deep thoughts. Deep thoughts. Um, and solid naps. And some really strong conversations with yourself. Because yeah. other people are just like, I'm not going to talk to them because she's kind of crazy. Probably. Okay. Yeah. Lots of naps. Construction of these escape holes took the prisoners probably about six months. Finally, the holes were wide enough for them to squeeze through and enter the ventilation shaft. From this point on, the men would climb each night to the vacant upper level of the cell block where they set up a clandestine workshop. Here, over 50 raincoats, some stolen, some donated by other prisoners, would be transformed into an inflatable 6x14 raft and some life preservers. Frank Morris had found the design for the raft in an old issue of Popular Mechanics. Nice. Its construction involved painstakingly sticking together sections of the raincoats, strengthening the joins with glue stolen from the prison workshop, and sealing them with heat from the steam pipes that ran through the prison. Oh, that's pretty smart. Exactly. I mean, these are... Pretty intelligent guys, right? To figure this shit out. Yes. Yeah, a lot of I, common sense. I say the raincoats are probably like a, a old school kind of rubbery consistency, you know, thick. Like, oh, wow. Like, like the Gordon's Fisherman wears? It, yes, exactly. <laughs> or the, the Morton Salt Girl. Doesn't she wear a raincoat as well? I don't think the word thick gets enough credit. We know you're thick, Dylan. It's mm. fine. Yes. Paddles for the raft were constructed from scraps of wood found around the prison held together with screws. As for inflating the raft, this was achieved with a um, a bellows fashion formed from Morris's accordion. Ah, there's a built-in bellow right there, man. Once the raft was completed, the inmates tested it. It worked, Dylan. So now they're ready. All they need is their, the right moment. To take off into the unknown in their homemade raft, which is a rather big. Six by 14 is pretty big, right? Now they just had to pray to Jesus that this thing was going to hold together in the rough waters of the bay. Well, that's one thing about it. Um, I think Russia does a, did a similar thing with like Siberia. Beria. Um, your prison's so in the middle of nowhere or has these natural obstructions around it that makes it like if you ran off... From the prison, like, you're probably not going to survive. What is the prison that's so terrible in Russia? Is it the Black Dolphin prison? Or yes, the Black Dolphin. Or the Black Porpoise? Or what it's is the it? Black Dolphin, bro. That prison is, like, terrifying. It's so scary. We should have an episode on that sometime. Well, it was even we were at, what, Brushy Creek? Yes. And they said that, uh, who's the man? No, we who... were at Brushy Mountain Prison. Brushy Mountain. I'm sorry, I always get it wrong. yeah. But and at that time it was it's still kind of out in the country, and at that time it was even more sparsely populated. That um, who was it? James Earl Ray, is that right? The uh, killed Martin Luther King. I believe so. Well, he was there. 
I can't, I'm not sure if he was the fellow who escaped. He was. Okay. He escaped, ran off into the woods, and basically gave himself up after about a day and a half because there's really there was nowhere to go. So, and I think it gives the prison, uh, the guards, and stuff kind of this. You wouldn't even try to escape because there's nowhere to go. So, in this case, you have the bay, choppy water, cold, uh, sharks. Pretty sure rip tides and currents, and just unpredictable, you know, weather patterns. So it's a it's a perfect natural barrier. And swimming over a mile, yeah. most people can't perform at that level of swimming, especially <laughs> in the in those conditions. Right, I could float a mile, and I'm I'm a good swimmer. But in choppy water that's dragging you left and right, and you know, threatening to wash you out to sea, no, there's no way. And I would say most of these guys, criminal types, probably not. Michael Phelps. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> now, of course, being absent from their cells for long periods at night held a lot of risks for the inmates. The guards did frequent inspections, and an empty bed would quickly raise the alarm. But Frank Morris had a plan for that. Before they even got started, he and his buddies constructed dummy heads made from a mixture of soap, toothpaste, concrete dust, and toilet paper. These were then um, painted with some paint that they stole from the maintenance workshop, giving them a fleshy tone. <laughs> I mean, they've like thought of everything here. They even had some real hair made from clippings they picked up from the barbershop floor. Shove some towels and clothing under the blankets to make that shape of a body, and it was easy to fool a guard with a flashlight. Well, yeah, because he's coming by and he's used to people being asleep and, and not moving. And he just kind of maybe flashes his light or get, just sees a silhouette. He's going through that same mundane routine he does every night. And I could see that working unless, you know, from a, what, cursory inspection. Exactly. No. Is that right? Yeah. Man. By June of 1962, all of the preparations were in place. June 11th would be the night of the Great Escape. Baby, you make me want to see the movie that's coming out. That's my son's birthday as well. For one of the escapees, though, there would be no shot at freedom. The hole in Alan West's cell had begun to crumble over the previous week, forcing him to shore it up with cement. This diminished its size, making it impossible for him to squeeze through. He did eventually manage the feat, but by then it was too late. Wes got to the roof to find that his buddies had already left. He then returned to a cell and went to sleep, only to be awoken after sunrise when the alarm raised. He'd later cooperate fully with authorities in exchange for immunity from prosecution. It is through his testimony that we know so much about the escape. Oh, so he's giving up all the deets. Giving up all the dirty details. So he's found in his cell after, and then they're checking every cell, checking everybody, and they see the hole, the obvious hole, even though, you know, it didn't work for him or it made him late. And so then, yeah. So Can you imagine <clears throat> the disappointment you would feel if you had this plan with your four, you know, the, the four of you had this plan, right? And you've dedicated all the time and attention working extra hard and then in the end this happens and you don't get to go can you imagine the disappointment well yeah and, and the frustration this, in this environment even a simple task takes forever because you have to be quiet or you can only do it for five minutes here five minutes there so i'm, I'm sure he's very disappointed and then he's worried about getting in trouble anyway because you can't hide the hole Ooh. okay yeah hide the hole is that a new game? No, it's is a name that of... a new children's playground game that we're going to have an adult rec league? What? I think that's illegal what you just said. Stop. Yeah, I don't know. Damn. No, I was actually just thinking you dig a hole and then everybody's hiding and, and you cover the hole and people run around and whoever falls in the hole first loses. <laughs> so basically you create a, a trap. <laughs> yes. With like bamboo, sharp bamboo sticks at the bottom and maybe a tiger down there. Yes. And whoever right? falls in loses and dies. And it's just fucked. Yes. See, I turned it around. I got a good game going. That's great. You know, and I can see that since kickball was ruined for you. 
you moved on to develop your own game, Hide the Hole. Hide the Hole, exactly. <laughs> oh, my God. Frank Morris and the Anglins would have made their move at around 9.30 p.m. immediately after Lights Out. Leaving their dummy heads in place, they squeezed through their escape holes and climbed to the upper level of the cell block. There, they retrieved their raft, paddles, and life preservers and hauled them up to the roof. Then they descended 50 feet to the ground, sliding down a vent pipe. Two 12-foot barbed wire fences stood between them and the shoreline, and they scaled these. From there, they headed for an inlet on the northeast area of the island near the power plant, which was a blind spot for the searchlights. It is there they inflated their raft using the bellows that they created. Then they took to the water, heading for Angel Island, two miles to the north. They would not be seen or heard from again. Oh, my gosh. So never found their body, never found anything, and they're just gone. Well, we're going to get to get Oh, my gosh. The response of the authorities, as you might imagine, was uh, frenzied once they realized these inmates were gone. Alcatraz had always been touted as, a, you know, this sealed up prison, no one's escaping kind of thing. It had a reputation to uphold. By mid-morning, multiple law enforcement agencies supported by the military were engaged in a joint air, sea, and land search. It would last for 10 days and turn up scant clues. On June 14th, a Coast Guard cutter found a paddle floating about 200 yards off the southern shore of Angel Island. Later that day, a commercial boat picked up a wallet wrapped in plastic. This had a list of names and addresses of the Anglin's friends and relatives. About a week later, shreds of plastic believed to be the remains of the raft washed up on a beach near the Golden Gate Bridge. The following day, a prison boat picked up a deflated life preserver made of the same material. This was found about 50 yards off Alcatraz Island. It left the FBI to conclude that the men had probably drowned. Oh. Well, and you know what? If they're never seen or heard from again, they uh, they have a reputation to uphold, like you said. So it, was, it wouldn't surprise me at all. They're like, oh, they did, we, we think they didn't make it. But we don't know. But wait, there's more. Oh, baby. So not everyone agrees that Frank Morris and his uh, buddies, his friends, his compadres, met their demise in the cold waters of the San Francisco Bay. Opinion is sharply divided on the issue. The most common argument against their survival is that none of the men was ever heard from again, and that it would have been um, pretty, I'm not... Absolutely, but pretty nearly impossible to disappear so completely with every law agency in the country looking for them. The argument usually put forward um, to support their success is that no bodies were found, which would surely have been the case had they drowned. Two out of the three drowning victims, or two out of three, is typically recovered from the bay. Oh, so just from past experiences, be it an accident or someone trying to escape... Um, the chances of finding a body is pretty good. If you drown and die, you tend to wash back somewhere and they find you. Exactly. Okay. Um, a massive 10-day search involving the Coast Guard and Air Force turned up nothing but a few bits of debris. According to the pro-escape group, these had probably been deliberately thrown into the waters by the escapees to create the impression that they had come to a bad end. Yeah, because, that, I mean, that's perfect. If they think you, if you do escape, make it to land and safety, and then they think that you perished, then they stop looking for you. So that's ingenious. Exactly. In 1989, one of our favorite television shows to stream Dylan Unsolved Mysteries. I love me some Robert Stack. We do love the old Stack. Attempted to put an end to the speculation once and for all by staging a recreation of the escape. Three experienced kayakers were put into a raft similar to the one used by the escapees. They had to be rescued from the bay after their craft came apart halfway across. A swimmer following a similar route succeeded in making the crossing. In 2003, the Discovery Channel program Mythbusters, did you ever watch that? I used to before it got kind of silly. Because, you know, at first they were doing like urban legends, things you'd always heard all your life, you know. And then after a... 
a, a little while, a couple seasons or so, they ran out of all the known, and then they were just like, what happens when you put gunpowder in a wall and light it? What happens when you put some pop rocks in your butthole, <laughs> right? Stuff like that. Well, now I'm wondering what happens because is the moisture from your butthole going to make them pop? Um, I'll tell you when we wrap up the show. <laughs> and is it? Well, hey, it was for science. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so Mythbusters repeated the experiment. It used a raft that was constructed using the similar materials and tools available to the inmates. And they actually made it successfully across the bay, landing at the Marin Headlands. So the crossing was definitely possible and really not even that difficult. Okay. Based on their study. But perhaps a better gauge of viability is an actual escape attempt. On December 16th, 1962, inmate John Paul Scott tried to escape the island by swimming to freedom. He made it all the way to Fort Point, a distance of 2.7 miles, where he was later found suffering from hypothermia and exhaustion. Scott had covered a great distance, even greater than that which Morris and the Anglins had aimed for. He had done it in less favorable weather conditions and without a raft. Damn. It just shows the human spirit, Dylan. When you want to escape prison, you're going to do it. You might lock up my body, but you can never stop my mind, Mr. Warden. Freedom. What does... um? Oh, my God. Are you Braveheart yeah. right now? Freedom. Do they? That's when they cut his balls off, bro. He you. screams I love freedom. You. I love you, Minnie Penny. Money Penny. See, to have... I want the, to marry you. The... the <laughs> That's totally not even right. Okay. To be such a, a leader of your people... That you scream freedom very emotionally when they clip your balls instead of fuck or oh my God, only being concerned about your balls. He was concerned about everyone. I love to hear Scottish yeah. people say fuck. And that's why. It's like fuck. William something. Wallace was a great man. Did they really clip his balls? See, I didn't know that part. Ah, they were torturing the fuck out of him. You know, yeah. who knows if it's just for the movie or? Oh yeah, I don't know. I'll have something to... from Mel Gibson. I haven't seen Brave Heart since what was that like nineteen ninety four or something? It's been a long ass time to go back and watch it. That was pre uh, crazy Mel Gibson, right? Pre anti Semitic rant Mel Gibson, and I don't know, whatever. I mean, you know. It changed the way I thought about Mel because, like, dude, you should know better. Even if you feel that way, which you, you know, you suck if you feel that way. Like, you should know better and just like lose your shit yeah, on somebody like that. It's kind of like, what the fuck, Mad Max? Why are you going to be a prick? Why can't you just call somebody an asshole or something? Why you got to just be on their race or religion or some shit? I don't know. Or his ethnicity. What's fucking wrong with people? Anyway, <sighs> so, okay. Can we, we love Jews. Can we get back? I'm just saying. It's true. I was married to one. So perhaps the Alcatraz three did make it across after all. But if that is the case, then what happened to them after they made landfall? Alan West's testimony might offer a clue. The plan, according to him, was to burglarize a clothing store and then steal a car and head east. The FBI had always claimed that no such crimes were reported around the time of the breakout. It had frequently cited this as further proof that the escapees had ended up at the bottom of the bay. This is not entirely true, though, Dylan. Well, I mean, if they are able to contact anyone or communicate with someone on the outside, they could have had a little bit of help. A blue 1955 Chevrolet was stolen in Marin County on the morning after the escape. And the same vehicle later spotted or was later spotted 80 miles east of San Francisco in Stockton, California, where it was involved in an accident with another motorist. He said that there were three men in the vehicle. Well, there you go. If those three men were, in fact, Frank Morris and the Anglin brothers, then it was the last official sighting. Of course, there have always been reports since, as is always the way with these high-profile cases. Most of these can be readily dismissed, but there is at least one that bears mentioning. Are you ready, Nolan? You're going to mention it. I'm going to mention it. Okay. So, Get your, your unmentionables ready for some mentioning. In 1975, a childhood friend of the Anglin brothers returned from a trip to Brazil and told members of the extended Anglin family that he had met up with John and Clarence in Rio. Ooh. Which I've always wanted to go to Rio. Oh, um, is, that, is that Rio de Janeiro? Yeah. Like, oh, I'm sure I didn't say that like right. Like carnival, you know? It's carnival. What, wouldn't that be fun? Yeah. 
whatever. Don't and they have the big Jesus? Look, I'm country. It's carnival. Don't they got the big Jesus statue up on the mountain? They do. And then I watched that. Was it like a Pixar movie about the birds? The parrots or whatever. The macaw, what are they called? Macaws? Was it Angry in, Birds? In Rio? No, I think the movie was called Rio. Ah, uh, yes. You know, uh, sadly, there is some uh, very, very horrible poverty there in Brazil. A very uh, huge disparity between the haves and the have-nots. It's true, but that's where we get the butt lift from. <laughs> also, that just, that <laughs> makes the rest of it okay. <laughs> hey, we don't really agree with your economic policies, but we got the butt lift. Thank goodness for the butt lift. Fred Breezy even produced a photograph of two men standing near a large termite mound, of all things, which he said was taken on the farm where the men were staying. The photo was somewhat fuzzy, and the men were wearing sunglasses, making um, like a conclusive identification impossible. Nonetheless, forensic experts examined the photos and asserted that the two men were more than likely the Anglins. The story would later be called into question when uh, Brzezzi's uh, background was examined. So he was like a con artist, according to his ex-wife. And he found it impossible to tell the truth, was known as a pathological liar. Well, I don't think character... um, What, statements on your character from your ex-wife are ever... (laughs) Very seldom going to be favorable, right? You, you ever met the couples that like they broke up or whatever, or even divorced, and now they're like best friends, and now now they have new partners, and they all get together and like hang out and laugh about how great friends they are. You ever known anybody like well, that? Well, you kind of just described my relationship with my ex because we hang out with them sometimes. Uh, well, you know what? You brought your exes up a lot tonight, and and, <laughs> and you know I'm just like. What the fuck, man? No, I'm not. I don't care. You was, at talk- the, you was at the cookout with them, too? What are you talking about? I, I enjoyed your ex's meat as well. You, I know. <laughs> I got to fix this. I'm sorry about the noise, people. Your, that, mi- your microphone. That mic was just in my face, man. It was kind of a, I don't know. I know how... I know how it can be now. Okay, so the sighting in Brazil eventually came to be considered a hoax. About four years later, which would have been 1979, the FBI closed its investigation and transferred the case to the U.S. Marshal Service. According to the Bureau, Morris and the Anglins were long dead. I just have a hard time believing that if they weren't dead, that the federal government... The FBI would come out and be like, yeah, they outsmarted us and got away. Well, see, here's the thing. They're always going to be like, nope. Well, sure they are. Yeah, right? And this is what, what year was this? This Around? 79, but they escaped in the 60s. It was like 60, gosh, now you've made me have to go back in my notes. It was 62 when they escaped. Yeah, I mean, and back then, is that that Hoover FBI still or was it even before that? I, I don't know. I thought Hoover was still around. Yeah. At this time. Well, I mean, the FBI was not a not very trustworthy source of anything. I mean, like they are now, anyway. Uh, but uh, yeah, so if typically people who drown in the bear recovered, two out of three, even statistically, you would figure one person at least in this group would probably be discovered if they all three perished, correct? Yes. Seems right. Uh, they didn't find, uh, you know, Big water raft at a certain spot. They just found, you know, some debris and things floating around the bay. No telling where they came from. And as far as them disappearing and never being heard from again, this was an easier time to kind of assume a new identity. And you wouldn't want to be, you wouldn't advertise well, we who you were. like the border patrol <clears throat> right. and that type of thing. So they could have gone to Mexico, South America. They could have ended up in Canada. If Anywhere you, else in the world. In that time, in the 60s, 70s, if you traveled far enough from where you started, you could start a new life and make a new backstory for yourself, grow a beard, a big shaggy beard, and you look completely different. And, and so it's not impossible for them to have, you know, disappeared into the shadows, never to be heard from again. You know what they say, Dylan? They say a lot of things. Wherever you go, there you are. <sighs> oh my God. However, the case would be back in the news in January of 2020 when a company called Iden TV was contracted to analyze the Brzezzi photo. 
This Iden TV is a pioneer in facial recognition using the latest technology, including AI, to achieve accurate results. So in this case, a convolutional neural network was trained to recognize the brothers from old photographs. This photograph from Brazil was then entered into the system. It concluded with a high degree of confidence that the men in the photo were actually John and Clarence Anglin. Whoa. Yes. That's what the computer said. That is the computer. The, that's the end all be all right. Can so the you? computer was like, this is the Anglin brothers. Computer says, yay. Oh, you little Britain fans. Alcatraz Prison closed its doors as a federal prison in 1963. Today, of course, it's a very popular tourist destination with the cells of Frank Morris, John Anglin, and Clarence Anglin attracting the most interest from visitors. I know it's second. The cell of the Birdman of Alcatraz. The Birdman, yes. Yes. So, yeah, yeah I, I've heard of that. Have you heard that? You've heard that story before, right? Yeah, didn't last pod on the like last podcast on Lyft, didn't they cover the Birdman, I believe, extensively? They had um, some episodes devoted to Alcatraz. Oh, yeah, but I mean, I've just heard these in various movies and, and documentaries, is or is it documentaries? Which Whatever you want to say. Um, tomatoes, tomatoes, right? And wherever you go, there you are. I mean, that's a deep statement that you... That is like a Dylan statement. <laughs> Dylan says, like, either it'll happen or it won't. No, that's not what I say. Either they will or they won't. Either they will or they won't. And Heather acts like this is one of those mush mouth nothing statements. It is a nothing statement. That means nothing. It doesn't mean anything. <laughs> I would argue this is one of the most realistic, deep, honest statements that one can ever utter. <sighs> because is it not true that either they will or they won't? Yeah. So right. Why do you even say it? Because it it means basic to me. It means you can't control it. You can't control what they do. So therefore, it doesn't matter. Because either they will or they want. Okay. Won't want. Well, Dylan, uh, thanks for that. I can I can never get enough of your Dylanisms, and okay. I think our listeners are on board for okay. more Dylanisms. Yeah. I'm still the reigning champion. Of the bowling, league, the fam- oh, of the family bowling league. I, I just f- want to remind you of that. I feel like this is the next forty eight hours of my my life. How I'm going to be know? reminded of how you beat me and your daughter twice. Yep, two games in a row. You mean I won? When you say I beat you, it sounds violent and aggressive. You won the competition. Is that is that if, for clarification? I am the champion, my friend. All right, Heather Mercury. Okay. Well, Dylan, that's what I had for this week's offbeat. Do you have any other um, little tidbits of information to throw at us? Um, no, no, I don't. Honestly, I don't have anything in my pockets. I mean, there's that. How can folks reach us, Dylan? Uh, you can contact us at mountainmurderspodcast at gmail.com. We do love to get those listener emails. We do. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And if you're feeling extra sassy and you just can't get enough of Dylan, join us at patreon.com slash mountainmurderspodcast. Loads of content over there. Support we- the show. Yes, for as little as three bucks, you get a ton of freaking content, bro. We mention it every episode because we want you to be part of our Discord chat. That's what it's all about. It's really fun. It's not even about the monetary support that you can give us directly that makes us feel so good about what we do. It is about getting your ears access to this content and and join the Discord chat because we have so much fun. I love all my Discord fam. You say that every episode we know, Dylan, and we want everyone to be part of it. So, call it a night. Say good night. Say goodbye. Goodbye. All right. Good job. Yeah.